let's go ahead and uh, jump in to session 14. So we're in session 14, the, the uh, 12th chapter of Daniel, which is going to focus on the climax of all history. This is the most comprehensive and detailed prophecy of future events to be found anywhere in the Old Testament. And uh, it's the climax indeed. We're going to take the last few verses of chapter 11, which tie right into the, thir the 13 verses of chapter 12. So it's actually a short session. And uh, we're going to see in this uh, segment the emergence of a world ruler, far beyond Antiochus Epiphanes, but one for whom he was a, a foreshadowing. We're going to understand there'll be a world religion. And there are lots of misconceptions on what that world religion probably will be. We're going to talk about a final, climactic world war. A world ruler, a world religion, and a world war. But it's also going to involve a time of tribulation which is, whose focus is on Israel. It'll be worldwide, but the focus is on Israel. But the good news is there's a deliverance at the end of that tribulation. There'll be a resurrection and judgment and a reward of the righteous. And if you work really hard to make yourself really righteous, you'll fail. You want to remember the, the uh, wedding guest that brought his own garment was thrown out of the hall because the custom was that the host provided the garment. That was a, uh, a tradition at that time that is used in an air parable. The garment you want to be wearing is the righteousness of Christ by trusting him and his righteousness. But in any case, let's get into it. Now, just uh, recognizing that uh, uh, some of the attendees here may not remember the, or have the benefit of the review, it's worthwhile to have a little focus of Antiochus Epiphanes in her background. So we're going to just remind you or summarize quickly or, or refresh on some selected verses on Daniel 8, where um, out of one of the, the four horns that uh, succeeded uh, Alexander, out of one of them came forth a little horn, which was actually exceeding right toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land, idiom for Israel. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host, and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Referring, of course, to the desecration of, under Antiochus Epiphanes. Then there's some interpretive verses we encountered. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. Those interpretations of Daniel 8 aren't contrived. They're given to us uh, right in the text. And the rough goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Who is the first king? Alexander. Alexander the Great. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, the four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Those are, of course, uh, after 22 years of fighting, we have the four principal generals divide up the empire. But it's going to focus on a specific guy. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty. By the way, understanding dark sentences, you know, that, that is an occultic illusion, I believe. It could mean many different things, but I suspect that it, it, it includes an occultic understanding. It's interesting to discover how many world leaders were deeply into the occult. It's not usually in the press, but uh, the leading, the deepest occult society in Germany was the Thule Society, which became the Nazi Party. It was born out of those occult uh, uh, rituals and things. And we could go on to others, but let's just keep moving on here. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Whose power? Whose power? Satan. Satan's. Good for you. And he shall destroy wonderfully or awesomely. And he shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And that's also a reason why I believe this is an allusion to a post-rapture situation because he overcomes the saints. This is mentioned several times, both here and in Revelation 13, and all that is a contradiction, it would seem, from Matthew 16 at the Caesarea Philippi. But we've been through that before. Let's move on. And through his policy also he shall, see, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. That's it. He's going to encourage chicanery. How interesting it is today. You know, it used to be, not many decades ago, 
that we connected character with destiny. If you're strong and we're a man of integrity, you could go far, go a long way. We've disconnected that in our culture. Today, the idea is to get ahead any way you can. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and uh, so sue me, who cares? You know, it, 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 you saw the previous, especially in the previous administration. Um, anyway. Through his policy shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Interesting phrase. This leader is a peacemaker. He's not a military general. He'll become very militarily strong. Who can make war with him, the scripture says. But that comes later. By peace, is, he makes his... He shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. So anyway, that's a little refresher. Let's jump into that portion of chapter 11 that where we left off last time. We're going to, verse 36, first 35 verses had to do with history, clearly. But when you get to verse 36, it's still history, but it's history with a second level of insight here. Let's go to uh, verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will. That's where we get this term, the willful king. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is ter determined shall be done. So this is, it's interesting, I've mentioned this before, but I want to emphasize it again, it's interesting every illusion you find, whether it's in Daniel 7 or 8, or whether it's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, or whether it's in Revelation 11, 13, 17, wherever, you always find him shooting off his mouth. Every place he shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. There are many descriptors that occur all the way through here, but that's one that's the most consistent. That's why I sometimes with my tongue in my cheek, call him Mr. Big Mouth. He's a, he has 33 titles in the Old Testament and 13 in the New, but we'll add one to that. Um, and he shall prosper until the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he sh shall him magnify himself above all. Here it is. See, there's a whole verse just nailing this. He's exalting himself above all. This is very satanic in its, in its origins. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. This is one reason that many experts believe he's Jewish. There's a whole list of reasons you could argue that he's a Gentile. There's also a list of reasons why it, one can build a case that he's Jewish. And the scholars debate that back and forth. They also forget there's two guys. It's not one guy. It's a, it's a duet. But in any case, it says he shall not regard the God of his fathers. The, the next phrase, nor the desire of women, is often misunderstood. Some people figure, well, gee, he must be a homosexual. Um, that's not to be ruled out, but that's, you should understand that's a phrase in the Hebrew that's a messianic title. The desire of women is a phrase alluding to the fact that the dream of every Jewish mother up until Bethlehem was to be the mother of the Messiah. The desire of women is regarded by rabbis, some of them, not all of them, it's not universal, but many rabbis would argue that that's a messianic phrase. So shall not regard the God of his fathers nor, the, nor, the, nor his Messiah is one way some would read that phrase. But it's not the only way. It's very important as we delve into these situations to do two things simultaneously. On the one hand, we should try to understand as best as we can the Jewish context here because it is a Jewish God speaking to his Jewish people through Jewish scribes and, and scholars. Let's not forget that. Uh, that, that, that alone often will clear up uh, some misconceptions. But the, at the other side of the coin, let's also be sensitive to the fact that God is very, very precise. We can make many, many examples of where the precision of his expression is astonishing with 2020 hindsight. Um, and so recognizing that the purpose of prophecy is not to predict the future, but to glorify him when the future happens. There's a big difference. It's what mathematics call a nonlinear function. Works in one direction, not both. Anyway, um, anyway, those are kind. Of, nor regard any god. See, not only does he, 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 he shall not regard the god of his fathers, nor regard any god. 
for he shall magnify himself above all. What one can presume is that the circumstances that leads up to this are such that there is one gigantic leadership vacuum that he fills. Um, it's very, very possible that somehow he will take over the leadership, not just of the Vatican, not just Mecca and the Muslims, but the world, the world. He shall exalt himself above all that is called God, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians. Read that Allah, among other things. Not just that either, but so you need to understand the scope of this. He shall, regard the, he shall not regard the God of his fathers, whether, whatever, it is, whatever they are, whether he's Jewish or Muslim or whatever, he doesn't regard that anyway, nor the desire of women, which if it is messianic, it could fit, or maybe it's possible also there's a homosexual overtone to this, who knows. Nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. So that says it pretty clearly. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. A God whom his fathers knew not. That's interesting. He is going to honor someone that nobody knows. The twist. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Really. You know, you can, you can muster a long number of passages out of the Old Testament where God pronounces judgment against those that would presume to partition his land. And many people who are watching of, 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 of biblical sophistication, watching the politics in the Middle East are alarmed and concerned as we seem to join, I say seem, to join those that would partition the land. And there's some very, very compelling reasons why they have to partition the land to survive. If they're a democracy and the birth rate of the, the uh, Muslims are 10 to 1 higher than the Jewish community, it's a, it, you can predict where the crossover is, where the majority in a democracy will be non-Jewish. they got a problem. The answer to that problem, of course, is a monarchy, and there are people even talking about those kinds of things there in some places. But you need to understand there's some very compelling forces that are at work uh, in the geopolitical arena. But on the other hand, God will not want his land partitioned. And yet one of the things, that, that, he's not the only one that may do this, it may happen sooner, but he certainly, among others, shall divide the land for gain, and I think the land there is Eretz Israel. That leads us, of course, to verses 40 through 45. Now, the verses we've just read, by the way, can be read in a way that fits Antiochus Epiphanes, sort of, but clearly they're transitional. They fit him, but they fit even better the, the end time. It's a double reference kind of thing. But we get to verse 40, the, what some people call the Armageddon scenario. You know, you always hear about the Battle of Armageddon and who, what's going to happen. It's not out of uh, Revelation 16, it's out of Daniel 11. Verses 40 and following. Verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. So apparently there is a king of the south, and we, from identity, most of us assume that it somehow involves Egypt. Shall push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Who is the king of the north? Traditionally, it's Syria, but some scholars feel it might be idiomatic of even further north. Some people try to make this fit the Armageddon, the uh, Ezekiel 38 passage. That's a source of, of different views among good scholars. But in any case, the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen. And by the way, the main battle tank of Israel is the Merkava. Merkava is Hebrew for what? Chariot. Yeah, chariot. Anyway, and with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into, his, into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land. And many countries shall be overthrown. No surprise so far, but the rest of this verse comes as a big surprise to many. 
but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Verse 41 of Daniel 11 lists a portion of the planet Earth, for some reason, escapes his thumb. Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. And when you look at your maps, your Bible maps, and say, what on earth is Edom, Moab, and Ammon, you'll discover it is a region that we know today as Jordan. And it's very interesting that of all the enemies of Israel that Jordan has signed, a lasting, so far, peace treaty with Israel. They, have, they, they, they share some very serious problems, mainly water, that they have to agree to and so forth. But the net of it is, is that uh, um, for some reason, Edom, Moab, and chief uh, 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 children of Ammon escape um, out of the hand of this coming world leader. No one knows why or how. Um, we, sp we conjecture that the reason these don't go under the Antichrist is to give the remnant a place to flee to. Because Jesus, in instructing his disciples, says, When you shall see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, whoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea, not New York, Rome, or London, or whatever, the, them which be in Judea, flee into the mountains. Don't even start to get a coat. And just pray it's not a Sabbath day. Not on a Sabbath day. In other words, you split and you split now. Where do you split to? The mountains of Judea. Where is it? What's the east? That's Petra. And uh, that's in Jordan. That's apparently where they, they, they go to. <laughs> Speaking of the Antichrist, in verse uh, 42, He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Then the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with a great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas. That's between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So that ends chapter 11. Let's keep rolling here on chapter 12. Remember I said we see a world ruler, a world religion, a world war, time of tribulation for Israel, deliverance at the end of the tribulation, and resurrection and judgment, and reward of the righteous. That's what's all going to be packed in a few verses here. Je Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 is a verse that was quoted by Jesus Christ when he labels the last half of the 70th week of Daniel. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. Then let them which be in Judea flee and so forth. For there will be a time of trouble such as the world had never seen or ever would see again. A time of great tribulation. Jesus uses that phrase. Where does he, he labels it that way from Daniel 12, verse 1. Let's read Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael, Michael the archangel, shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even at that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Wow. At that time. Three times it says it. What time? And by the way, it's a during. It's a continuation kind of time. And uh, Michael is your prince. It's interesting how the... the uh, Archangels, both Michael and Gabriel, have very specific job descriptions. Michael is always a military commander on behalf of Israel. And Gabriel is always an enunciator, an advanced man, a communicator on behalf of the Messiah. Those, that seems to be their specific duties. And uh, there may be other uh, archangels that also have other duties, but they're not mentioned in the scripture, so we can only guess. But uh, so uh, Michael's mentioned four times in the scripture. And who is he always battling? Satan. Satan or his hosts, indeed. And uh, it's interesting that even Michael doesn't bring railing accusation against Satan, but the Lord do it. The book of Jude has a very strange passage. The point Jude is making that we should not speak evil of dignities. But the dignity he chooses to make an example is the strangest one you can imagine. Satan himself. Even Michael the archangel dare not bring railing accusations, but said, the Lord rebuke you. 
Let the Lord deal with it. You don't let the Lord deal with it always. Interesting passage. I get very nervous when some people sing, sing these songs, you know. I'm so glad Satan's so mad. You know, this, these things border on, on uh, need, some, need some thought. Satan is a created being. And, uh, but he's very, uh, he's, and don't get confused. He's, there's two mistakes you can make. You can ignore him on the one hand or you can overreact to him on the other. But he's a created being, but very, par very powerful, very resourceful. And uh, don't confuse your biblical insights by some of the colorful allusions from English literature, from Milton, Dante, Goethe, and others. Those are very colorful, but uh, f far cry from what the Bible presents. The Great Tribulation is what Jesus labeled it. It's not seven years, it's three and a half. It's the last half of that. Jesus quotes this very verse in Matthew 24, 41, uh, 21, Mark 13, 19, and Revelation 7, 14. And, uh, Je Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Joel, they speak of it as the time of Jacob's trouble. And this, of co and this time is parallel to what we're reading here in uh, Daniel 11, 40 through 45. And time of Jacob's trouble. It doesn't mean it's not just Israel. It's worldwide, but it's aimed at the sons of Jacob. Israel is to pass under the rod, according to Ezekiel 20. It's the purpose of it. It's called the furnace of affliction in Ezekiel 22. And it's a very interesting verse in the end of Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, where God says, I will return to my place. To return, he must have left it. I'll return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. That's singular and specific. In the time of their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. That's one of the purposes of the tribulation, is to drive Israel to the wall and uh, purge them uh, and only one third will be spared, according to Zechariah 13, 8, and 9. About one Jew in th one in three was killed in the Nazi Holocaust. But Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9, in implies that uh, two out of three will be taken in the next one. And I read that on the radio once, and it was declared an anti-Semite by the uh, Anti-Defamation League, because I read their scripture on the radio. But I didn't say it, it Zechariah did. But anyway, uh, so, so. Time of Jacob's trouble. The woman in Revelation chapter 12, I believe, is Israel in the sense that it began with Eve, the seed of the woman. But the woman there gives birth to the man-child, and it's the seed of that woman, the thread, that starts with Eve and finishes with Mary. And... Uh, uh, if you understand that, then Revelation 12 becomes very clear. If you try to make the woman the church or something, you get in all kinds of confusion. Because if she's the church, she's in big trouble. Because she's pregnant. Not the virgin bride, she's pregnant. So you've got to sort that out. And that same chapter, Satan is cast out, which means he's no longer in heaven able to accuse. He's out to do mischief firsthand. And, uh, but the, all through the scripture, there are repeated promises Thy people shall be delivered. Twice just in this last verse. Daniel 7, Zechariah 12, 13, Jeremiah 30, Isaiah 14, Job 1, 2, Zechariah 3, Revelation 12, etc. Uh, Thy people shall be delivered. That's the great promise of hope to see them through this area. The second verse of chapter 12, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting uh, condemnation. And... Uh, that's a poor translation, by the way, uh, because it, it is, it, it, the Hebrew sharply separates two uh, classes of resurrection. And a better way to translate would be, and many from among the sleepers of the dust of the earth shall awake. These shall be under everlasting life, but those, the rest of the sleepers, those who do not awake at this time shall be unto shame and everlasting contempt. Now this leads some scholars to argue that this resurrection is, um, um, uh, 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 well, let's put this, let, 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 let me go down that path. The everlasting, the, the, the ones that are not resurrected then are held until the great white throne at the end of a thousand years. That's the basic thrust of this. There's some other nuances, but I'll stay out of that for this, for this particular uh, review. Many, it says. Not all, by the way. As you go through your Bible, realize that it's always a select few. You look at Abraham in Genesis 22, and I was summarizing in Hebrews 11:9, Job in chapter 19, 
he makes this incredible declaration. I know, I believe, and that he's able. Uh, in, in my flesh shall I see God, and so forth. Isaiah 26, which I believe is even, could very well be an allusion to the rapture if you look at it closely. Hosea 13, 14, and of course Christ in Psalm 16. Anyway, let's move on. Verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. This is the first occurrence of, the term, of everlasting life in the Old Testament. We find some of it in Psalms uh, 16, 10, 49, several passages in Isaiah, and so forth. Um, and of course, what we have uh, the allusion here are to Jewish teachers. Some would try to identify this 144,000, maybe so, maybe not. And, uh, um, and, and obviously, the lights is an allusion that's all through the scripture in that, in that sense. Now, what about this issue of the rapture? This is another controversy that we're not going to try to hammer here, but does it, is the rapture, some argue that it only involves the church, because the rapture is really aimed at church, which is, which is the focus of which is the Gentiles. But we find all kinds of people who are written in the book, alluded to in Exodus, Psalm 69, Luke 10, Revelation 13, 8, 17, 20, and elsewhere. Um, not all are prepared, apparently, Ezekiel 20, and that, of course, leads to the, 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 the parable of the virgins and so forth. Israel is blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So that you know, Romans 11.25 clearly gives the, the, the uh, gathering of the church a Gentile complexion. And, uh, uh, so, and uh, the, the issue of being blotted out is, of course, in, in Ezekiel 32 and Psalm 69, as well as Revelation 3.5. But the main point to, that you need to study on your own and be sensitive to that not all saints or elect are in the same category. There are people that are saints or elect in the Old Testament. There are also saints or elect that are in the church period. There are also saints and elect, if you will, after the rapture in the so-called, what some people call the tribulation saints. You need to understand there's at least three categories, maybe several others that you can discern. And uh, the... Uh, that's an important thing to understand so you don't get confused. Many people jump to conclusions where it says saint, there's a certain passage where it speaks of saints or elect that it refers to the church. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, John the Baptist was certainly a saint, certainly an elect. And yet uh, Jesus in one context says, he that's least the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. What does that mean? That means simply this, that John was the close of the Old Testament period. Doesn't mean he wasn't saved, but he's not part of what Jesus ordains from Acts chapter 2 onward until this period between the Acts 2 and the rapture is a very strange period. And once you understand that, all these other passages, will, I think, will come clear. But you need to come to those conclusions by your own study, not because someone you know, sold you the idea. Daniel 12 verse 4 is often quoted, but I think in the out of context. The angel says, says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Daniel's book is sealed. That's in contrast to the book of Revelation, which is conspicuously unsealed. There's a huge contrast, deliberate here, between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. They have many similarities, but Daniel's book was sealed until the time of the end. But then he says something in it. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And uh, so it's interesting... Uh, there are many, many things today that have been revealed that we did not know decades ago. I'm speaking biblically. Um, the, uh, the word here in the Hebrew is not knowledge shall be increased. There's a ha hadat. There's a the, the knowledge shall be increased. And the, in the context here, it's this knowledge. The context of verse 4 is the scripture. Not knowledge in general. People like to point out that you know, knowledge is exploding. They say that knowledge doubles every 10 years. If that's true, then half of everything we know has been, uh, you know, has been added these last 10 years. Half of everything we know. Is, and that, from an information science point of view, that could very well be. But that's not what this is talking about. Many people quote this in that context. And I'm not saying it's not true. That's not what this is focusing on. This knowledge, this prophecy is what it's talking about. It's linking uh, here with verse 3, the previous verse. And, uh, and Abra, Amos uh, 8.12, uh, the Lord will do nothing but that which he reveals to, through his servants, the prophets. And uh, 
Israel's blindness is to be relieved, according to Romans 11.25. That's a very key prophecy. Jesus pronounces judicial blindness on Israel when he rides the donkey in. But now your house is left to you desolate because you didn't recognize the day of your visitation. Okay, forever? No. Paul tells us it's blind until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. God is looking for a number to complete his church. When that number is complete, he tells his son to go get him, brings him in. But So the, the, the knowledge will be increased. Sealing means making it secure, preserved until the end. Daniel's book was sealed until the end. What's interesting in recent years is more and more of Daniel is just opening up. That in itself is, in a sense, is a fulfillment of prophecy. And uh, I remember I had a very vivid experience. Um, I was in a, a, a routine back in those days where I operated out of Big Bear. And uh, I would go down the hill, about an hour and a half drive down to, uh, to Torrance to uh, do a Tuesday night uh, study at Hal Lindsey's church in Torrance. And after I did the service, I'd go and stay at his home up in, in uh, uh, Palos Verdes. And he had a guest room there, and I'd, I'd show up, uh, you know, 11 o'clock, whatever it was, and then we'd wrap until 2 or 3 in the morning in a study about various things. The, the following morning at, at, at a local Marie Calendars, I did a men's Bible study, and then I went back up uh, home to uh, up at Big Bear. So I'd come down Tuesday, do the Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, and go. that was my cycle every week for a period of time. And I can remember one time, because I was wrestling with Ezekiel 38 in my studies, and I discovered something that startled me, because everybody wonders who Gog is. Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38, because it's very unlike the Holy Spirit to introduce a major uh, person of some kind without some background, and there's no background. But uh, I, I discovered in, the, in Amos, chapter 7, verse 1, not in, the, not in the Masoretic text, and thus the English, but out of the Septuagint, it happens to read very differently than the Masoretic. A small subtlety in the Hebrew causes the difference. Uh, uh, the, 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 the way it's translated in the English Bible makes no sense at all, frankly. Um, and it's, neither does the Masoretic. But the, the Septuagint reads just subtly different. It speaks of some locusts. It says uh, that um, some, uh, there were, the locusts were coming and the, the young, devastating locust was Gog their king. And I thought, wow, that's because I, from, from when you study Revelation 9, you know there the locusts are demon locusts because they have a king, Abaddon and destroy, you know, he has these names. And you know from Proverbs 30, verse 27, that the real locusts have no king. So the fact that the locusts in Revelation 9 have a king is a tip off that these aren't natural locusts, they're, it's an idiom for demons, you follow me? Well, anyone that's been there through that study, when you discover Gog is the king of the locusts, you realize he's a demon king. And what startled me about that was I didn't find that in any of the commentaries. I just happened to stumble it by, by another method. So that had happened when I went down the hill to did my Tuesday night thing at, 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 at Hal's church. I did my usual thing. When I got to home that, with him that night, sat in a study, he says, Hal, have you? And I was, I was blown away because that's the first thing. Am I wrong? So he reached up and got his copies down and we, we checked it out. No, it's absolutely right. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not only is, are you correct, it's not even a variant reading that is the correct in the Septuagint. Well, he took it all in stride. I was stunned. Because here I'm just a layman. I came across something I couldn't find in the commentaries. He wasn't surprised at all. I was stunned because you know, wow, cause he, all of us have traveled in Ezekiel 38, 39 for decades. It's, it's familiar ground. And here to discover something that it, it blew me away. And uh, I was excited, and when, especially when he confirmed it, because he's quite a scholar and a uh, 35 year Greek scholar. But anyway, he. Uh, he wasn't surprised at all. He said, Chuck, that's, that's Daniel 12.4. What? Said, What's that? He, the knowledge shall be increased. He, he, he also pointed out the knowledge. The knowledge of the, of the scripture will be increased. It should not surprise us that discoveries will be made, not necessarily by experts, just by the Holy Spirit, whatever, um, but that, we, that, that things are opening up. We understand things today that we never did before. The intelligent arrows of Jeremiah 59. You all have our little lists of little nuggets here and there. But the point is, we should not be surprised that, um, uh, that our understanding of the scripture is increased, especially as we raise our standards of interpretation. The more literally you take it, the more it unravels. It's when you start compromising with it and allegorizing it, you get, into, you get down in these bramble bushes. So be careful about that. But anyway, that's so much for verse 4. Let's move on. Um, verse 5, then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two 
the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And some scholars, by the way, visualize Christ and two angels here, but that's conjecture. There's no, it is what it is. One said to the, uh, to the man clothed in the linen, a third in other words, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Well, boy, we'd like to know that. That's a good question. And I heard the man clothed in the linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So here's again one of these weird references to three and a half years. Three and a half years, remember we saw it in Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, we saw it in Daniel um, uh, uh, 12, 7 here, we've seen it in Revelation 11, 2, we've seen it in uh, Revelation 13 and a half. In some places it's called three and a half years, another place it's called 42 months, another place it's called 1260 days. And it all cranks out, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, three and a half years, it's, it's uh, 42 uh, uh, months of 30 days each, it all runs out to 1260 days. So we've encountered that again and again. It's the most documented period of time in the entire Bible, Old and New Testament. But here we have something else that should echo in our memory from Revelation chapter 10 and other places. He raised his right and left hand and swear by him that liveth forever. He's taking an oath here. And we shall accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be accomplished. And I heard, but I understood not. This is Daniel talking. I heard and I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Before I go on, by the way, it's interesting to see that Daniel is recording material that he did not understand. I am so tired of reading books on hermeneutics that always insist that we have to interpret the, the passages as the writer understood them. That seems reasonable at first, except it's contrary to experience. You can find places in the scripture where the person is faithfully recording it and has the foggiest notion of what the Holy Spirit's intending with this stuff. It's only with later that we look back and understand it. And uh, uh, so that's what we call inspiration. It's guided by the Holy Spirit. And uh, you should be very, very cautious about trying to confine the Word of God into the understanding of the penman. Because uh, uh, I can understand the caution on the one hand, but you take it with a grain of salt. Because here's one example. Because Daniel's recording all this stuff, but he did not understand it. He just presumed that his forebears, the re you the readers, would not be able to read, relate to it more than he can. But he then turns says, Oh my Lord. That's another reason why I think the third person, the one in the middle, is Jesus Christ. Anyway, Oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel. And uh, the word go here isn't physical. It's more of a mental attitude kind of thing. Your words are sealed, but you keep, you keep going here. He said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And one of the reasons we're increasingly confident that we're moving into the time of the end because we're increasingly being able to put so many obscure prophecies together to make, a, to make sense. It's becoming very clear. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Wow. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And this has puzzled scholars. The libraries are full of conjectures because everybody knows that half the week is twelve, three and a half years is twelve hundred and sixty days. But from the abomination of desolation, it goes 1260 plus 30. What's that 30 for? We have no idea. We know that the, the, the uh, tribulations come to an end at 1260, but there's a 30 day window here. So you find scholars presuming that maybe that's the time it takes to face the judgment. There's all kinds of things that happen after the Christ sets up his, he sets up his kingdom. That doesn't happen in, in one day. 
Some argue there's some aspects of it that may take 30 days. That's their conjecture. We don't know. But it gets worse. Verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. 335. So apparently after 1260, you got the 30 days from, from verse 11. You got another 45 days on top of that. Uh, until, you see, it says there shall be, you see, from the time the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh death set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. We don't know what that means. It may be the formal setting up of the kingdom or something. But then he has an interesting extra blessing here. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. We have no idea. There's thirty plus forty five. There has been someone that, that has done some calculations having to do with bearing the Ark of the Covenant on the shoulders of Levites from Axum to Jerusalem as taking about that time. But that's conjecture. That's conjecture. Who knows? But the final words, But go thou thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. And so ends the book of Daniel. So ends the most comprehensive prophecy in the Old Testament. Now we have this whole business, of the, remember when we talk about the Antichrist, we've learned a lot of things about him. He shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, because, and we know from Revelation, no man shall be able to buy or sell except one who has the mark of the beast. His mark, that's the issue, not your pin number, his mark. He shall magnify himself in his heart, Daniel says, but in Revelation he's given a mouth speaking blasphemies with, with power to continue 42 months in Revelation 13. Again, the same echoes. By peace he shall destroy many, Daniel tells us. The rider on the white horse then comes the red horse of war with him. It's a false peace. The rider on the white horse in Revelation 6 apparently brings peace, but not really. He's traveling in bad company because the red horse is right with him there. He shall stand up against the prince of princes in Daniel. And of course the first beast of Revelation 13 is against Christ. That's what antichrist means, a, a pseudo-Christ, antichristo. He shall receive great power by subduing others, we learn. And, and, and he shall rise to power by promising false security. He'll be intelligent and persuasive. He'll be controlled by another, Satan. He'll be an adversary of all Israel and subjugate Israel to his authority. He'll rise up in opposition to the Prince of Princes, the Lord Jesus Christ, and so forth. His rule will be terminated, of course, by divine judgment. Now, if we look through the Old Testament, you can find 33 labels. This is a list of some of them. And I won't try to go through them all. There's a few you want to be sensitive to. The Assyrian, Isaiah 10 and Micah 5 seem to emphasize that he is an Assyrian. Yes, he's from the Roman Empire, but not, we not Western Europe. He's from the eastern leg of that empire, which outlived the Western one by a thousand years. So if you want to study more of this, I encourage you. To, we have a whole briefing package, two-hour briefing on just the Antichrist itself. So you can dig into that if you like. The idol shepherd. In Zechariah 11, we have the only physical description I know of in the Bible. A physical description of the Antichrist. You'll find in the last couple of verses of uh, Zechariah chapter 11. And, of course, obviously the little horn of uh, Daniel 7 we talked about. The prince that shall come is a very important title out of Daniel 9, which we covered. The seed of the serpent in Genesis 3.15. Everybody talk about the seed of the woman. There's two seeds in Genesis. When God declares war on Satan, there's two seeds alluded to. One is the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. The other is the seed of the serpent. Satan's going to have a, ser a, a seed of some kind here. And of course, the willful king was in Daniel 11 here. So those are just a few. In the New Testament, there are 13 at least lists and, and, and names. Various ones that you come across in various kinds in various places. The Antichrist is the one that we tend to use I think it's sort of unfortunate because it's mis it leads to a lot of misunderstandings. And of course, obviously, the beast of Revelation 11, he's the false prophet of Revelation 13, the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians 2, the son of perdition in the same chapter, and some other ones that are probably a little more fuzzy, a little more ambiguous. But where do you go next? We've been through one of the most interesting books in the, in the Bible, one of the most documented books in the Bible, one of the most fruitful in the personal walk, as well as being an a, a, a incredible book apologetically. Because with the book of Daniel, you can definitively prove Jesus Christ was the Messiah. From several places, but the, uh, Daniel, the, your, the, the Daniel 9, I encourage you to master those passages in Daniel 9 
They're precious. But you say, okay, Chuck, that's great. We've enjoyed Daniel. Wonderful book. Where do we go next? Lots of choices. You can actually go anywhere. But one of the places most people would like to be drawn to is to go to the book of Revelation. This would be a natural study for many of you. One of the things you want to do if you go to the book of Revelation, you need to understand that it has 404 verses, which include 800 allusions from the Old Testament. The reason it's a closed book to many people is because they haven't done their homework in the Old Testament. So if you just be prepared for that. Every, it's the book of Revelation is in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the Scripture. One of the reasons it's such a it's the only book of the Bible that promises you a blessing. It's the only book of the Bible that promises you a special blessing to the reader or the listener. Uh, no other book does that. A lot of places read the Bible, sure. But only one book has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. And it does. It's, it's very, and one, one of the blessings you get is to go through it properly. It will take you into every other book of the Bible to untie all those interesting little riddles and so forth. The other thing you might want to do, depending on your tastes and interests and so forth, we, do, we, ge we generally strongly advocate going into the Bible expositionally. Take a book and go through it verse by verse. Go, go, take a book and go verse by verse. We generally don't push on what we call topical studies. Nevertheless, there's a place for them. But uh, we think the most fruitful thing is to go expositionally, sort of the way we've done through Daniel or Genesis or whatever. Uh, but there are sometimes topics you want to dig into, and we've done briefing packages on those. One of them is the Antichrist. We, like many, have, uh, have for many, many years taught the idea that the Antichrist is coming out of the Roman Empire, so he's out, we always watch Western Europe with great interest. That's, that's myopia, because if you study the Bible carefully, you'll discover that he is called the Assyrian, among other things. And so there's a whole other scenario you want to at least be aware of. And uh, so a, we did a fairly comprehensive review of the Antichrist as a topic in a briefing pack. The other thing, the other topic that gets, uh, is, has to be the most preposterous doctrine in, Christi in, in uh, fundamental Christianity, the rapture. It is the most preposterous concept imaginable. It has only one thing going for it. It's unquestionably correct. I'm always reminded of uh, Richard Feynman of Caltech. He's probably one of the most prominent quantum physicists uh, in the physics world. And he says that about quantum physics. He says there's nothing more preposterous than the, the things that they've learned out of quantum physics. It makes no sense at all. It's absolutely the most absurd thing you can imagine. There's only one thing going for it. It's unquestionably correct. And uh, it's his little paradox. It, it, that paradox fits the rapture. It's a crazy idea. It's a bizarre idea. But once you really start studying the Bible, you'll discover it is correct. We, we try to take that that whole issue rather aggressively through it. Because there are a lot of people doing that are really troubled by that. There are a lot of people running around saying the rapture is a new idea. It wasn't early church. Wrong. It was believed by the early church. It was, all, it was taught all the way through by a, a small group all the way through the history, the uh, uh, minority, view, minority view. Most people are victims of church history. And church history is pretty dismal. From Augustine on, there was all kind of, they did a lot of good things, but they also perpetuated some, some falsehoods that have become indoctrinal, <coughs> doctrinal in most of, most of the uh, you know, uh, uh, mainline denominations. The whole idea of amillennialism and so forth is part of it. Anyway, you, uh, the rapture is a study you might want to get into. Uh, the other thing you might want to do, is, if some people would also like to really deal with this heaven and hell. Everybody thinks they're going to heaven. Are they really? Almost every concept about the afterlife held by the world is wrong. Almost, I'd say most concepts that many Christians have of what the Bible teaches about Sheol and Hades and Gehenna and whatever are wrong. And so we try to deal with that on a good biblical point of view. All of these, by the way, are dealt with against the fabric of the total in our study, Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. I'm sort of assuming, you've, if you haven't gone through that, I encourage you to do that first because that will give you an overall perspective and it will touch on all of these things. But in any case, if you haven't gone through learning the Bible in 24 hours, I encourage you to begin the book of Revelation, or Genesis, or Ruth, or Matthew, or John, or whatever. <laughs> so take your pick. But the main thing is let the Holy Spirit lead you. And uh, the one thing I hope this uh, has done is encourage you to get serious about your Bible studies. To get really serious about your Bible studies. I, uh, what I often t uh, talk to an audience about, I'll say, have you got a hobby? How many of you have got a hobby? How many, how many here do not have a hobby? Anybody has a hand up would likely to lie about other things too. I suppose. There are two things I'll tell you about your hobby. One is that you probably have more invested in it than you want your wife to find out. Okay. 
But the second, yeah, the second thing is you probably know more about your hobby than you do your profession because it's a labor of love. And uh, that's probably true of me too. You know, I made my profession my hobby about 12 years ago. I, said, I did this for years, just as, as extracurricular recreation, doing Bible study. I just did that for fun. I took myself seriously as a Bible teacher. And about 12, 13 years ago, I, I, I've been teaching the Bible for 30, 40 years, but as a hobby. And I switched it around, obviously, at 12 years ago, and uh, through, through the encouragement of Hal Lindsey and some others. Anyway, uh, one of the things I'm going to suggest you think about is make the Bible your hobby. That sounds a little weird. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, invest in it. If you don't have a set of helps on your, own, on your, on your library shelf, get some. If you're computer literate, explore some of the helps that are available on the computer. I travel with a laptop that has probably more volumes than you'll find in most seminary libraries, and it's all word searchable, not just the Bible, all kinds of other things. You do not have to know Hebrew and Greek today to get at a good exegetical background because the, the computer will analyze the sentences for you. They'll translate it for you. They'll help you with it if you're really into that. The point is the resources available are incredible. But I encourage you to, to make it your hobby. Get serious about your Bible. Learn about your Bible. Get a good Bible set of encyclopedias, either a one-volume set or a five-volume set. So if something comes up, a place name or a person or whatever, you can quickly get a few paragraphs of background. So you'll, you'll, just, you'll, you'll, you'll just grow that way. And, uh, the, and one of the most powerful things you should do if you're not in a home Bible study, uh, find one. There's probably one in your neighborhood. Some of them are being organized by profession rather than by neighborhoods. You may have to drive an hour to the one you want to go to. Uh, sometimes it'll be all accountants or all attorneys or people who have other things in common that will meet together as a small group uh, once a, during the week to really get into some serious prayer for each other, hold themselves accountable, and then get into the Word of God. That's where people grow, not on Sunday mornings. Sunday morning is a great place to celebrate and uh, knocking that. But get in a home, home group. Find out what's around. Explore it. Search, for, search it out. If you can't find one, start one. It's easy. You can get a, a, one of the popular videos, pop it in, and invite some neighbors over for you know uh, some pie, co coffee and pie, and watch a one-hour video, and then just discuss it and watch what happens. Hey, can we do that again next week? Sure. And there's all kinds. You can do singles. You can do. You can start doing three or four a little series, or whatever. Anywhere from just a one-shot thing, or to uh, uh, go through learn about 24 hours as a group. There are workbooks available. There's there's study questions, all that sort of thing. There's a, there's a discussion questions for leaders, guides for leaders. All that stuff's available. It's easy to do. And starting, you do not have to be an expert to start a home Bible study. All you have to do is be able to facilitate discussion. That's not hard to do. You can, you can do enough just, and, and you don't have to have all the, you don't have to have any of the answers. To lead the group, you do not have to have any of the answers. You can pray it through. Hey, we'll look into that. I mean, you know, you don't, you're not going to resolve all the issues. You don't need to. All you have to do is facilitate, have some prayer, get through the thing, share some ideas. And if you want to, you can, and, and there's, there are all kinds of helps around. So I want you to encourage that. That's where people I have in, in the 50 years I've been an active Christian, more than that 50 years, um, the place I've seen people grow almost invariably is in small groups, not on Sunday morning. The, 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 you know, people are beginning to recognize Sunday church is a spectator sport. They want to participate. The young people want to, they want to be in small groups. That's what's led to these incredible stories across the land of, of growth. So, well, with all that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, again, Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to meet like this and to go through your word. We thank you for the book of Daniel. We thank you for his example. We thank you, Father, for those things that you've tucked away here for our learning. And, Father, we would pray that through your Holy Spirit you would just amplify those things that you have here for each of us individually. We pray, Father, that you would just regalvanize us into a, a new priority that your word will have in our lives. We pray, Father, that we would put it first. We do pray, Father, that you would, through your word and through your spirit, help each of us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, and help each of us to be more effective stewards of the resources and the opportunities that you put before us. We pray, Father, that we each, through this growth, might be more pleasing in your sight. 
oh, Father, we just do pray that you would illuminate very clearly for each of us what you would have of us in the days that remain. Because as we see, search the horizon, we recognize, Father, that there are signs of the times in front of us. Help us to make the most of the times that remain. As we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation this night, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.